Hello. I'd like to welcome you to this webinar hosted by the Charles F. Kettering Foundation. We really appreciate everyone who's joined us to listen in today. And I'm seeing that there are people from all over the world. Thank you. For those of you who don't know us, the Charles F. Kettering Foundation is a nonpartisan, nonprofit operating foundation committed to advancing inclusive democracies by fostering civic engagement, promoting government accountability, and countering authoritarianism. My name is Paloma Dallas, and I'm the Senior Program Officer for our Democracy Around the Globe Focus. This webinar is part of a series put on by our Democracy Around the Globe team as we explore emergent trends and democratic threats in this critical election year for the United States and for countries around the world. And I'm delighted to introduce our panelists today. Steve Levitsky is the David Rockefeller Professor of Latin American Studies and a professor of government at Harvard University. He's co-author of How Democracies Die and Tyranny of the Minority and a Kettering Foundation Senior Fellow. Maria J. Stefan is co-lead and chief organizer for the Horizons Project. She's former director of the Program on Nonviolent Action for the United States Institute of Peace former co-director of the Atlantic Council's Future of Authoritarianism and co-author of Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict. And last but certainly, certainly not least, Ziad Majed is an Elliot E. Burdett Professor of Middle Eastern Studies, Associate Professor in the Department of History and Politics and Program Coordinator for Middle East Pluralities at American University of Paris and coordinator of the Arab Network for the Study of Democracy. Begin with some opening remarks from Kettering's president and CEO, Sharon L. Davies, and then end with remarks from Kettering Foundation Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, John Bedford. And so now it is my great pleasure to introduce Kettering's President and CEO, Sharon L. Davies. Sharon. Thank you, Paloma. Greetings, everyone. I won't take long because like all of you, I wanna to get to the important discussion among our esteemed panelists. And on behalf of the Charles F. Kettering Foundation, I thank each of the three of them for their contributions to today's discussions. Thanks as well to each of you for making time to attend this Democracy Around the Globe webinar. This webinar reflects the Kettering Foundation's commitment to advance inclusive democracy at a moment of deeply concerning global backsliding, and in a year where half of the world's population will be engaged in democratic elections. In its 2023 report, Freedom House warned that with declines in democracy stretching for a 17th consecutive year, the battle to preserve democracy may be approaching a tipping point. Much of the trend lines of rising authoritarianism stems not from violent coups, but the creeping power grabs of authoritarian leaders. Lovers of democracy are right to take notice of this trend. But Freedom House also stressed, as will our speakers today, that the contest between dem democratic and authoritarian norms is far from over, and that while authoritarians pose an extreme threat to a liberal democracy, they are not unbeatable. It's imperative that defenders of democracy work together or the emboldened advocates of illiberal democracy will prevail. With this webinar and others to follow, the Kettering Foundation commits itself to being part of the fight for freedom and the rights and privileges of citizenship for all people. That is the work of inclusive democracy. The weapons of authoritarians are division and fear. With those tools, they undermine systems of checks on their powers. They hold themselves above the law. They target the most vulnerable 
and they seek to divide the public so that they can rule without accountability or public constraint. We are here to imagine a different outcome. First, by squarely facing the reality that there are those who seek to benefit from social disharmony and indeed intentionally foment it. And second, by illuminating the pro-democracy alliances that can and must be forged to fight against the forces of division and unchecked power, forces that seek to usurp the sovereign power of the people to govern themselves. With today's discussion and more work to follow, let each of us pledge that we will not go gently into the dark night of illiberal democracy, but rather that we will rage against the dimming of the light of democracy until through the victory of freedom and the rights of all everywhere, the light of democracy shines brightly once again. Thank you all for being here. I turn the program back to Paloma Dallas. Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> I appreciate you for setting the stage and just really telling us what's at stake here. Thank you. Um, I'd like to turn now to our panelists. Uh, Steve Levitsky, I'm gonna start with you. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. What Thank are you. the what are the authoritarian trends around the globe that concern you? And how do you see these same trends manifesting in the United States? Okay, big question. Um, I'm gonna sort of step back and focus on the, the big picture. These are long-term trends over the course of, of a period of time. Long-term and in some ways, probably irreversible trends. Um, it's really important to keep in mind that, um, and they're both, international, external and domestic um, challenges here. First of all, it's really important to keep in mind that the international environment is much, much less favorable to democracy today than it was back in the 1990s. The 1990s and the early 2000s were a truly unique period in global history. They were a period that was uh, unusually, uniquely favorable to democracy. With the collapse of the Soviet Union the U.S. And, to, and the EU became, for about 15 years, the world's dominant economic, military, and ideological power. And they used that power to promote democracy like never before and, frankly, never since. Um, for about 15 years, democracy was really the only game in town. There were no serious counter-hegemonic powers to which autocrats could turn for support. Russia in the 90s was in a state of collapse. China was just beginning its rise. So for about 15 years, countries, developing countries across the globe, pretty much had to be on good terms with the West. Uh, and that that post-Cold War international environment gave rise to unprecedented democratization. The number of democracies in the world more than doubled between 1985 and 2005. But, but those unusually favorable global conditions didn't last. They couldn't last. Um, as all of you know, global conditions have changed dramatically over the last couple of decades. The rise of China, together with Russia's resurgence as an aggressive anti-liberal power, have fundamentally altered the geopolitical balance of power, putting an end to that brief era of Western liberal hegemony. So autocrats now in much of the world can increasingly turn to China, to Russia, to other illiberal powers for assistance. And at the same time, unfortunately, the power, the prestige, the self-confidence of, of the liberal West has declined in the last couple of decades. And as a result, Western powers have lost both the will and the capacity to aggressively promote democracy abroad. Our external muscle is not what it was in the 1990s. The EU, for example, which played such an important role in democratizing and helping consolidate democracy in Southern Europe in the 70s and Eastern Europe in the 1990s did relatively little to combat rising authoritarianism in Hungary in the early 21st century. In the United States, which played a crucial role in Central America's democratization in the 1990s, did very little to stop backsliding in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Honduras in the 2010s. So the international environment is much less favorable to democracy than it was in the 90s. The days when the US and Europe were the world's dominant military, economic, ideological power, those days are over. 
aspiring autocrats can turn to China, to Russia for assistance. Uh, and the U.S. And, and other Western powers do not promote democracy as consistently or as effectively as they did in the 90s. And those changes have um, dramatically expanded existing and aspiring autocrats' room to maneuver. It is simply much easier to be an autocrat on the world stage today than it was 30 years ago. And I'm not sure there's anything we can do, frankly, to reverse that. Let me very briefly say that there are also some, some domestic um, patterns, changes that, that, are, that are worrisome. And I think that we know less about. For, for some combination of reasons that I don't think we have fully nailed, um, electorates, citizens in democracies all over the world, with very few exceptions, um, are really discontented, are really grumpy. Uh, not only are they voting out incumbents, incumbents have lost the last 20, 20 democratic elections in Latin America. Not only are voters turning away incumbents, they are turning away from democratic political classes in general. They are increasingly dissatisfied with and distrustful of democratic institutions. We see this not only in the global South, but also increasingly in the West. Um, this is this is uh, th this pattern is sort of jumped markedly since COVID. So COVID, I think, almost certainly contributed to this grumpiness. Uh, I think it's increasingly clear that social media is playing a role in contributing to this uh, to this grumpiness. And I think in the United States, in particular, rising inequality and and declining social mobility have have also increased this um, sort of lack of faith in democratic institutions. So, but what whatever the exact combination of causes, voters are increasingly turning to anti-system political outsiders uh, from some on the right, some on the center, some on the left, but out, political outsiders who basically promise to take the political elite, put it in a bag and throw it in the, in the river. And um, these guys don't, oh, I'm talking about Trump, I'm talking about Bolsonaro, I'm talking about Meloni, I'm talking about Millet, I'm talking maybe about Le Pen, uh, Bukele in El Salvador, these guys don't always kill democracy, but when they get elected, um, the likelihood of some kind of a democratic crisis increases dramatically. Uh, and so we've got to, in addition to a, 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 a less favorable international environment, we've got to figure out why our citizens and democracies all over the world are increasingly dissatisfied with the way they're being governed. Thank you. That's that's. That's really helpful. I, I wanted to just follow up with a with another question saying, you know, as you think about when you talked about elected leaders, what are indicators of authoritarian behavior that people should be attentive to? In um in our book, Tyranny of the Minority, Daniel Zibalat and I argued that politicians and political parties that are committed to democracy, what what the political scientist Juan Lins called loyal democrats. Parties and politicians are committed to democracy must do three basic things. They must always accept the results of elections win or lose. They must unambiguously reject political violence. And they must refuse to cooperate with violent or anti-democratic forces. Now, Donald Trump has violated all three of those rules. He is unambiguously an authoritarian. I don't want to talk about Trump. I want to talk about a form of more subtle authoritarian behavior that citizens need to look out for that I think now, uh, I know we're supposed to be nonpartisan, but that now pervades the entire Republican Party. And that is this issue of cooperation with anti-democratic forces, what I would call authoritarian enabling. Important point, individual leaders can never kill a democracy on their own, no matter how bad they are. They need accomplices among mainstream politicians. These are what the political scientist Juan Lins called semi-loyal. Democrats, semi-loyal Democrats. Semi-loyal Democrats look like regular politicians. They dress like regular politicians. They talk like regular politicians. Um, but the, the key to identifying them for citizens is how they respond to authoritarian threats in their own camp. So when anti-democratic forces, violent or anti-democratic forces emerge on their own flank, loyal Democrats, committed Democrats do three basic things. First of all, they publicly condemn anti-democratic behavior, even if, if it's in their own camp. Second, they expel anti-democratic extremists from their ranks. They refuse to nominate them. They refuse to support their candidacies. And third, crucially, 
they are willing to join forces with pro-democratic rivals from across the aisle, from across the political spectrum, in order to isolate and defeat the anti-democratic extremists. This is Liz Cheney. This is Adam Kinzinger. Semi-loyalists do none of these things. Rather than publicly repudiate anti-democratic behavior on their own flank, they downplay such behavior. They justify it often through whataboutism, or they simply hide under the table and remain silent. Rather than expelling anti-democratic extremists, semi-loyalists tolerate them, accommodate them, sometimes even work with them. And crucially, semi-loyalists refuse to work with partisan or ideological rivals to defeat anti-democratic extremists, even when democracy is on the line. The tragedy of semi-loyalty is that these guys aren't trying to kill democracy. This is not Donald Trump. These are ordinary politicians just trying to get ahead. They're just trying to become House Speaker. They're just trying to regain that Senate majority. They're just trying to stave off a primary challenge. But one thing we know from history is that semi-loyal behavior emboldens and strengthens anti-democratic forces. When mainstream politicians of the center-left or the center-right begin to tolerate, to condone anti-democratic extremists, it normalizes them. Major media outlets begin to treat them like ordinary politicians. Donors who once shunned them decide it's now it's okay to fund their campaigns. Leading consultants and pollsters start to return their phone calls. And crucially, voters start to take them more seriously. A clear lesson from democratic breakdowns in Europe in the 1930s, South America in the 1970s, is that when mainstream parties of the center left or the center right start to tolerate, start to flirt with anti-democratic extremists, democracies get into trouble. So Trump's authoritarianism is obviously a threat. After all, Trump broke the cardinal rule of democracy. He was the first U.S. president in history to refuse to accept the results of an election. But what really keeps me up at night is the fact that semi-loyalty now pervades the entire Republican Party. Republican leaders knew that Joe Biden won the 2020 election. Many of them, including McConnell and McCarthy, were privately deeply troubled by Trump's authoritarian behavior in the aftermath of the election, but they enabled it anyway. According to the Republican Accountability Project, 86% of Republican members of Congress raised doubts publicly about the legitimacy of the 2020 election. Republicans in Congress protected Trump by refusing to impeach and convict him. They blocked creation of an independent commission to investigate the January 6th insurrection. And crucially, nearly all Republican leaders will back Trump's presidential campaign candidacy, even if he's convicted of trying to overturn an election. It is this behavior, it is semi-loyalty on the part of mainstream politicians that ultimately will, will kill our democracy if it, if, if it dies. And that is what we need to watch out for. Thank you, thank you. Ziad Majed, I'd like to bring you in now. Um, thank you for joining us from Paris. Can you talk to us about democratic backsliding that's happening across established democracies and some of the broader global ramifications? Okay, thank you, Paloma. Uh, I, I will try uh, also not to repeat what was said because I uh, definitely agree on uh, the presentation and uh, the assessment that was made and the analysis. Um, I do have a few points maybe uh, to, to add because I think we, we have a very uh, complex question. It has uh, many layers and it has a history. Uh, and I think also that uh, this uh, uh, illiberal or uh, this anti-democratic uh, trend within democracies uh, did not start with uh, Donald Trump. Uh, on the European continent, I don't know if you all remember uh, someone whose name uh, was uh, Berlusconi, uh, Silvio Berlusconi, already won the elections uh, in Italy in the 90s. Uh, he had uh, those promises of uh, uh, making Italy great again, uh, bringing in the Roman Empire's uh, rhetoric. Uh, he was into the private or individual success, the image of someone who owned an empire of media, but also a football club, uh, and he used uh, metaphors and language that was sometimes uh, shocking for many people. And everyone thought this is just an exceptional moment, maybe because the Italian 
society was witnessing a series of crises. Uh, people are uh, unsatisfied uh, with the elite, with the establishment. He used some populist discourse, uh, promising to be a champion, uh, saving the Italians, uh, uh, giving uh, very uh, simple and simplistic answers to the economic uh, crisis, to the whole situation. We thought that it will end with this, maybe, uh, Berlusconi. What becomes, however, uh, alarming is when these people or this kind of political profile is in power, elected once. You can say people were trying, uh, as we said, they might be sometimes opposed to what they consider to be a culture of uh, uh, a certain privileged elite in the capital that uh, uh, has complicities in media, uh, in finance, etc. Mm, let's try someone else. The problem is that after trying uh, the other or the alternative, promising all what uh, Berlusconi, let's say, promised, and being once again uh, seduced by him or tempted to vote again for him, then there is a serious problem that goes beyond the moment itself and the reaction uh, to what is dominant uh, in the political life. And I think since that time, we have seen the rise of the far right with a populist discourse in Europe first, but then in America, in South America, in the Philippines, in India, in many places where we had the impression that the established democracy did create a certain tradition uh, that is based on institutions, uh, based on a political culture that will keep it away from these kind of vulnerabilities in which we see that democracy itself is threatened. And if we look at the map uh, today after the Trump experience in the US and uh, uh, all what might happen in next elections, if we look at the rise of Orban in, in uh, Budapest, in Hungary, uh, many uh, of the European far right groups that are either in power uh, in Italy, for instance, again, with, uh, uh, with the current uh, alliance uh, that we have, or in other places, in Poland, in the Netherlands, in France, uh, they are not in power, of course, but they are close. Uh, even a country like Sweden, with a long history of social democracy, is also threatened by that. Uh, they, they are part of an alliance uh, that is in power. Uh, the uh, uh, Austria, uh, many countries, uh, if we move to Latin America after Bolsonaro in Brazil, we have now the uh, current president in Argentina. Uh, so there is a tendency, for sure now, uh, more and more, showing that what happened in Italy in the 90s uh, was not an accident. Uh, it is revealing something uh, deep within the democratic system that we need uh, to examine. One can evoke, in fact, uh, symptoms or can start talking about uh, specific uh, questions that might be similar in most countries. Those groups that either reached power or might reach power within the dem democratic uh, framework, they all promise easy solutions to very difficult uh, problems. Many of them will find uh, ideal victims. Uh, they can blame them for all the troubles or the problems that the society is confronting. It's becoming now more and more common uh, in Europe, but I think it's also the case in the US and in many other places uh, to blame migrants or refugees. Uh, so uh, insecurity, migrants, refugees, uh, unemployment, migrant refugees. And you have here uh, what brings the populist discourse that is against local uh, privileged political elites that have been in power for decades, directly, indirectly, with their networks of influence, uh, uh, of connections in different institutions. You bring that and you connect it as well to uh, xenophobia, uh, to different forms of racism that is targeting uh, vulnerable groups in the society, mainly strangers, those who arrive, uh, those that you can uh, evoke fear uh, when uh, uh, mentioning them, uh, considering that they are a threat for your own culture and tradition. So you add another layer uh, to populist discourse that is this time about uh, migration, about uh, cultural differences, and about uh, human mobility uh, that is, of course, becoming more and more uh, difficult. Then there is a third layer. It's not a coincidence that with all those anti, uh, let's say, established uh, democratic models with all their uh, sometimes problems, uh, deficiencies, what needs to be reforms. But those who are opposed to this model, whether they say it uh, directly or 
through uh, political metaphors and allusions and practices, they are also opposed to women's rights. Or uh, they will add to uh, uh, racism, sexism. And I think it's a trend as well, and it's not a coincidence. If you look at all of them, they will bring in what some people would call uh, reactionary values. Uh, we might call them in different manners, but they will also consider that emancipation among some specific categories within the society, among some minorities within the society, are also harming what they do consider as a pure culture uh, in some Western contexts, uh, whether in Europe, in the US. You then add to it something else related uh, to uh, the economic model itself. Now, we can all have, uh, of course, and there are lots of injustices today, social injustices in this in the model. There are people who were forgotten while uh, sciences is imposing its, its uh, own uh, speed and rhythm in transforming societies. Uh, there is a rural world in many European country that, uh, countries that was marginalized, uh, but they will uh, use all that not to talk about social justice or to modify economic policies in order to bring what could be called social justice. They will use it once again as a tool uh, to attack uh, institutions, uh, to attack the European Union, uh, to attack the international system, uh, to talk about globalization uh, uh, as uh, just the source of the problem being imposed on the national uh, level or on the national scene. So you do have in their uh, discourse complexities also, even if they are into simplism and into populism, but they will add different layers. Each is addressing a certain instinct, a certain fear among some groups and uh, transforming them, uh, transforming that fear into a political action opposed to institutions, opposed to uh, the judicial system, opposed to uh, what is called sometimes mainstream media, opposed to uh, not only political elite, but we have seen it also during COVID, scientific elites. Uh, so they try to appear as uh, the heroes from outside all the institutions, uh, even if many of them are very privileged uh, due to the system itself, but they want to appear as outsiders in order uh, to save uh, uh, fragmented, fractured uh, societies in difficulties. This trend is uh, uh, international and uh, it is uh, well now witnessed, observed, analyzed, and we are living in, through it uh, in the West. We have now in Europe, the European elections for the European uh, Parliament. Uh, polls uh, are uh, alarming in the sense that they are showing the far right uh, becoming probably the first bloc in the European Parliament, which is something that uh, was never uh, considered a possibility a uh, few decades ago or few years ago, but it's becoming a reality now. And I agree with uh, uh, Stephen when he mentioned that some of the uh, supposedly democratic elites uh, might sometimes due to some compromises they make or to what they consider to be some um, discourses or measures allowing them to weaken uh, the far right, they might contribute into the far right discourse itself. We have seen it as well among many governments who are center right or center left. They consider that in order to fight the far right, we have to adopt part of what it uh, repeats. So we might use a, a rhetoric that uh, the far right uh, uh, uses when it comes to security, when it comes to migration, when, it's done, when it comes to some economic measures, pretending that that will bring some people who will vote to the far right to uh, the center or will allow us to have uh, more votes, uh, except that it's not true because it's normalizing and it's banalizing and it's making the far right discourse as part of the political scene as if uh, it is accepted and as if it is uh, uh, legitimate uh, and... and uh, should be uh, dealt with uh, normally. I'm not saying that, of course, uh, any discourse should be banned except when it uh, violates uh, clearly uh, the questions of uh, human rights, of racism, when when it talks about or in, in, uh, encourages uh, hatred, etc. But making uh, the far right discourse a normal within the political arena has uh, allowed 
candidates uh, promoting some reactionary values, uh, if you want, uh, to be uh, uh, just uh, uh, members of the elite, of the institutions, and uh, promoting their, uh, uh, their speeches and their programs and their platforms uh, like all others. If you add to that the fact that internationally we are uh, going through a series of crises, economic crises, political crises, uh, with uh, rising powers like Russia and China pretending that they are alternatives to a declining uh, West, uh, that might be as well in many already authoritarian countries uh, in Asia, in Africa, uh, that might have some echoes in the sense that, in any case, if Western democracies are not performing properly anymore, if their foreign policy uh, is a foreign policy of double standards, if they have colonial legacies, in the case of Europe, with many African countries, Russia and China are proposing themselves as alternatives uh, with no such colonial legacy, with a different approach, uh, with the idea that we don't want to talk about human rights and democracy, uh, that the West instrumentalized, weaponized, uh, used in different ways. We are just here to deal with you, etc. And they are uh, getting more and more allies. If you look at the African map today, more and more countries are becoming uh, closer and closer to either Beijing or Moscow for different reasons. But among them is this uh, troubled relation with the West historically and in, in uh, uh, recent years, in addition to the fact that democracy is less and less being used and promoted uh, in any case, uh, you have the question of double standards, uh, that if you are uh, from the Middle East, you can see it uh, in an, uh, I mean, such a flagrant manner today, but also in the past. Uh, Ukraine and Palestine are dealt with in a completely different manner. Uh, you have uh, the relationship with many authoritarian regimes as long as they secure some economic interests and they uh, do construct walls in front of refugees and migrants, we deal with them normally and we sell them weapons and we consider that they are uh, partners and there are no reasons to uh, put pressure on them, etc. So foreign policy also with its double standards, in addition to internal crises, in addition uh, to uh, what is happening in the world, uh, economically and politically, uh, I think uh, all of that put on us lots of uh, uh, challenges on how to deal uh, with that, how to confront it, uh, how to remain very objective in analyzing it and trying to understand it and trying to deal with uh, the symptoms and the consequences, uh, but at the same time to be committed and involved and not neutral, because I think neutrality in front of violations of international law, of human rights, of uh, uh, democratic rights, etc., uh, would uh, allow uh, the violations to continue. And uh, I understand uh, some people would prefer to remain uh, bipartisan or uh, not really committed or involved. Uh, but I think it is a responsibility from a citizen point of view and from uh, an academic or an observer uh, point of view. Thank you, Ziad. Um, Maria, Stefan, I'd like to bring you into the conversation now, um, if you want to um, join us and then, you know, maybe in particular saying a little bit of something about um, the ways in which authoritarian and authoritarian leaning leaders are cooperating and learning from each other today. Sure. Thanks, Paloma. Um, and thank you to Kettering Foundation for organizing this forum. I just, um, you know, want to say that I think that these conversations and this type of um, learning forum is, is a critical part of a successful challenge to authoritarianism. So grateful for you all hosting this. Um, so, um, and it's also wonderful to follow in the footsteps of Ziad and, and Stephen, um, agree with, um, with all of their points about authoritarian dynamics. And one thing that's also at play is that the authoritarian playbook, um, not only has it been translated into many languages, but authoritarian leaders are cooperating and learning from each other across borders. Um, the historian Anne Applebaum has described the transnational network of authoritarian leaders, uh, security actors, propagandists, and kleptocratic financiers as autocracy, Inc. 
Um, so we know, for example, that authoritarian regimes in Russia, China, Iran are making a concerted effort to exploit existing cleavages in the U.S. Um, to amplify chaos, uh, to influence election outcomes using mis and disinformation. At the same time, I would posit that the global alliance of far right elected autocrats is having a particularly pernicious effect on US democracy. Um, so the relationship between Hungary's uh, Viktor Orban and the MAGA dominated GOP is a case in point. Um, in 2022, Orban was invited to speak at the Conservative Political Action Conference uh, CPAC in Texas. Um, where he railed against immigration and woke culture, um, really homing in on trans and LGBTQ rights um, and children's education. He uh, described an ideological battle for Western civilization and called for uniting across borders. Um, incidentally, Orban's CPAC appearance came a few days after he gave a speech and declared that Hungary must never become a mixed race country. Um, meanwhile, depicting himself as kind of the defender of European Christendom against Muslim migrants, progressives, and the LGBTQ lobby. Um, it's noteworthy that Orban was the first year European leader to endorse um, Donald Trump's campaign in 2016, and he strongly backed the 2020 campaign. Um, it's also interesting because we know that in the U.S., uh, states are the um, are the laboratories of democratic backsliding. Um, and, you know, Orban's administration has very close ties, uh, for example, with um, Governor Ron DeSantis's administration in Florida. Um, shortly after uh, Budapest passed anti-LGBTQ legislation, um, the DeSantis administration passed their own version of Don't Say Gay um, anti-LGBTQ. Q um, legislation, and there are very strong media ties. So you look at um, the relationship um, that that Tucker Carlson, for example, Steve Bannon have um, with the Orban administration, and it's very close. Um, you know, another example of this, there's a lot of um, strengthening ties between far right autocrats um, in the Americas. Um, so uh, the relationship between Brazil's um, Bolsonaro and the GOP um, is a strong example of that. Um, very eerie parallels between January 6, 2021 in the U.S. Um, and the January 8, 2023 um, riots and coup attempt in Brazil after Bolsonaro lost the election. There, um, Bolsonaro had the support and assistance of Trump administration insiders, um, and he spent months predicting election fraud and then refused to concede defeat. Um, meanwhile, uh, Steve Bannon's War Room podcast um, parroted the stolen election narrative um, and referred to Bolsonaro's supporters as the uh, who were rioters on January 8th as Brazilian freedom fighters. Um, Tucker Carlson similarly supported Bolsonaro's claims of election fraud on Fox News. Um, so not only was there extensive um, interaction between uh, Bolsonaro insiders and kind of um, and MAGA leaders in the lead up to the election, but researchers at the University of South Florida found that Orlando, Florida, was a central hub of social media amplification about the January 8th, 2023 coup attempt in Brazil. Um, and then Bolsonaro was the invited um, speaker at the 2023 CPAC uh, conference after he lost the election. And then this year we saw that Ecuador's President Bukele and Argentina's President Millet um, were invited to speak at uh, the CPAC conference. Um, Bukele, funnily, I guess funny, not so funny, um, has referred to himself as the world's coolest dictator. Um, and he has mass popularity in El Salvador um, for cracking down on gangs and uh, drug cartels using, um, you know, very questionable practices. And so both Bukele and Millet have emphasized, you know, the necessity of fighting communists and socialists, which is something that's been a rallying cry of kind of far right leaders in the United States. Um, particularly, this was used to great effect in Florida um, to rally, um, you know, Latino and those with, um, you know, family roots in Latin America, um, you know, uh, as part of the DeSantis campaign, for example. So and just another kind of trend when it comes to authoritarian learning um, is that this phenomenon of queer scapegoating, 
the emphasis on the traditional family, um, you know, misogyny, the weapon, weaponization of male grievance, which often includes uh, support for policies and practices that seek to expand state control over women's bodies is a very common uh, shared uh, tactic amongst autocrats. There's this thing called the movement, which is a loose grouping of nationalist and populist um, forces in Europe, Asia, and Latin America that was founded in 2017 uh, by a Belgian right-wing politician. This is this, the movement inc also includes Steve, Steve Bannon, and these are kind of the messages and themes um, that they rally around. So, so yes, there's a lot of like learning that's happening between autocrats, and it just suggests that um, you know, small D Democrats also need to be learning uh, from each other across borders. Um, and that's probably one of one very good way to go on offense against Autocracy Inc. is to really invest in expanding of learning, collaboration between pro-democracy organizations, movements, actors um, in the United States and, other, and in other countries. Trying to unmute myself. Sorry about that. Maria, thank you. Um, wow. I appreciate all of you sort of setting the stage and what's at stake here. I'd like to shift the conversation now in a more hopeful tone about what we can do. And Maria, I'm wondering if you can kick us off. Um, what do we know? What do you know about effective ways of countering authoritarianism? Yeah, so the good news here is that we actually know quite a bit about how to successfully challenge authoritarianism and stem democratic backsliding. Um, and an important point is that even autocrats who seem to be the most powerful <clears throat> are typically vulnerable to strategic organized nonviolent action. Um, multiple studies, my own included, have found that the strongest bulwarks against authoritarianism and democratic backsliding are broad-based coalitions and movements that bring people together across political, ideological, and other divides, and that use a diverse array of tactics, both dialogue, but also direct action tactics like protests, boycotts, strikes, in order to collectively and stubbornly say no to authoritarian practices and yes to democracy of, by, and for the people, meaning all the people. Um, so practically what this means is creating spaces and infrastructure for cross-sector, cross-ideological analysis, relationship building, um, coordination. It means building a movement of movements um, and both engaging and pressuring key institutional pillars uh, that are providing autocrats with social, political, financial, and other sources of power, uh, both nationally and locally, um, um, in order, so these are these are what uh, enables the semi loyalty uh, that Stephen talked about. This system that holds up um, authoritarianism, and so um, we know also that in in reference to these pillars of support, that pro democracy movements typically succeed when they prompt loyalty shifts and defections in key pillars of support, which is more likely to happen when you have mass diverse participation in pro-democracy movements. So we've seen, you know, over the course of history, uh, you know, in places like Chile, for example, where the highly diverse no campaign used savvy organizing, very hopeful messaging to unsee Augusto Pinochet in 1988, or in South Africa, where the United Democratic Front organized effective civil resistance campaigns to put pressure on white owned businesses that put pressure on the apartheid regime. Um, you know, more recently, I think an interesting example in uh, Zambia, which is considered a bright spot of a country that has pushed back against democratic backsliding. You saw there um, an alliance between the, the Conference of Catholic Bishops and the Council of Churches, who organized a lot of pro-democracy mobilization. They resisted, they resisted then President Lungo's attempts to make constitutional amendments, um, resulting in the victory of an opposition leader. So a very good example of where a key pillar stepped up and helped um, prevent democratic backsliding. And I, you know, just thinking on our own history in the US, we have, um, as many have written, a long streak of authoritarianism in this country. We also have a long history of resisting authoritarianism 
authoritarianism. And I, you know, I take great inspiration from the civil rights movement, which I consider to be the greatest pro-democracy movement in U.S. history. And there, you know, this was a movement that dismantled uh, racialized apartheid and single party authoritarianism, which was then grounded in the Democratic Party. The movement worked because of strong organizational infrastructure, like the Southern Christian Leadership Council, like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, plus highly strategic targeted campaigns that targeted the pillars, the businesses, the faith institutions, uh, the, the state legislatures that were upholding um, apartheid, racial apartheid in the South. So very savvy. So even though the context has obviously changed, we still have remnants of Jim Crow in this country. I think the, the logic of organizing and strategic application of nonviolent power is still highly relevant. And you know, just to take the US, it matters a great deal uh, during the Trump administration that there was an unlikely alliance, pro-democracy alliance that came together. Um, you know, it mattered a lot when, you know, after the 2020 election, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, together with the Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, key Republican governors and secretaries of state, together with grassroots movements and unions, collectively demanded free and fair elections, that all votes be counted, and that there be a peaceful transfer of power. That mattered. Like, it was not inevitable that the United States would prevent a coup from happening in 2021. And we did that. Now, again, there's a lot of um, differences in the context now, but I think you know, another bright spot of Poland. Um, so after a, you know, a period of democratic decline um, where the law and justice party there that was modeled on Orban's um, kind of Fidesz party in, in Hungary was recently defeated in parliamentary elections by a civic coalition th that brought together, you know, left, right and center parties. And they were able to keep together a fractious coalition. And that is like, half the battle. So, you know, the entities in the US and elsewhere that are able to maintain spaces for people to meet, interact, learn, make mistakes and continue to grow together. This is, I think, one of the most important, um, you know, requirements, let's say, let's say for a successful pro-democracy movement in the US. Maria, thank you, that's fantastic. Um, Steve, I'd like to bring you in, same question about what we know about effective ways um, of countering authoritarianism. And I think you wanted to bring in some of what we might learn from Brazil. Yeah, first, you hear me okay? Um, first of all, I thought that uh, Maria's answer was terrific and that that she's she's right on. What is what is crucial um, is, a, is a broad coalition in two senses. First, a broad multi-party coalition that extends as, as far across the political spectrum as possible. We saw that in Poland, as Maria mentioned, um, and, but also a broad societal coalition, society, key societal actors, and I would focus primarily on business leaders and religious leaders need to very publicly get engaged and speak out about where those red lines are that uh, of, of democratic norms that, that cannot ever be crossed. Um, let me just say a word about Brazil that's optimistic and a word about the United States that's less optimistic. Um, as Maria pointed out, Brazil sort of paralleled the United States in, in many ways. And uh, Jair Bolsonaro was elected. He, uh, U.S. media called him the Trump of the tropics. Very, very similar playbook as Trump. He was a, a friend and ally of Trump. Uh, he had Steve Bannon whispering in his ear um, and, and governed a lot like Trump was, was pretty unsuccessful and uh, was narrowly defeated when he ran for re-election. Uh, and uh, and then tried to, to organize a coup to overturn the results of the election. Um, he failed. And I think the Brazil, uh, but, but that's where the, the cases actually diverge radically. Brazil's response, uh, both in society and on the political right, the, the role of conservatives here is critical, was very different from the United States. So beginning in 2021, uh, as Bolsonaro began to prepare uh, and began to sort of try to undermine the credibility of the election, key actors did important things. There was a, a, a major public letter signed by religious leaders, signed by the largest business group in the country, by trade unions in uh, in defense of democracy. So you had a very vocal public statement from uh, across society defending democracy. 
And Congress, which was controlled by right wing parties, passed a democracy law that um, made it explicitly a crime to attack democracy. On election night, when it is true that Jair Bolsonaro refused to accept the results of the election, every single one of his conservative allies, the president of Congress, major governors, the, the Ron DeSantis, the Kevin McCarthy, the Mitch McConnell of Brazil, all of them accepted the results of the election on election night. When Brazil had its January 6th like event on January 8th, um, 2023, all right wing politicians denounced the, the uprising uh, and conservatives in Congress pushed for an investigation into the uprising. Nobody downplayed it. Nobody called it a tourist visit. Nobody called the, the, the insurrectionists who were later prosecuted uh, patriots or heroes or, or hostages. And, uh, and, and when, when Bolsonaro was, uh, I think, appropriately banned from politics for eight years for trying to overturn an election and for trying to orchestrate a coup, um, conservative politicians accepted it. And so whereas Donald Trump is has a 50-50 chance of winning the presidency and is fully backed by the Republican Party, almost without dissent, Jair Bolsonaro is on the political sidelines today. That's an important difference. Um, and, and with respect, I mean, I, I agree with Maria, what she said about the, the U.S. response to the 2020 election, but uh, the societal response has been pretty weak in anticipation of 2024. Business leaders have not been especially vocal in defense of democracy. Many of the business leaders who pledged not to, to, to donate to, um, to politicians who refused to accept the results of the 2020 election abandoned that pledge and are funding these guys. J Jamie Dimon's statement several months ago saying, eh, Trump's really not so bad, was incredibly reckless, incredibly irresponsible. And religious leaders, I would say particularly Catholic leaders, have been notably silent notably silent in, in the face of, of what uh, are, are promised to be horrendous human rights violations, particularly on the border, if Trump is elected. So we U.S. society has not yet stepped up in the way that Brazilian society did and the way, frankly, that German society is right now. Steve, thank you. I, I really appreciate these distinctions that you've drawn. I think they're super helpful. Um, Ziad, I'd like to bring you in. Same question. Do you have additional thoughts on effective ways of responding and supporting democracy right now? Um, I think we can um, maybe add uh, two, uh, two levels. Uh, when it comes to the international cooperation, uh, there is a need as well uh, to have alliances uh, that are uh, opposed to the uh, far-right alliance, uh, that are uh, more and more focusing on the question of uh, democracy and the protection of democratic institutions and democratic culture. That can be done uh, on the level of political parties, but it could be also done on the level of uh, scholars, of civil society organizations, uh, of uh, citizens from around the world through different uh, fora, through different spaces. Uh, there is a need for an international alliance uh, defending democratic values and defending democratic practices in front of those authoritarian uh, attempts at decredibilizing and uh, uh, weakening further democracy. Uh, there is something else that I think uh, that I think is also very important, including in well-established uh, democratic countries that we are realizing uh, they are still vulnerable in, in different ways. Uh, the question of impunity. I think one of the most important uh, themes uh, and most important guarantees for uh, our societies and uh, for our institutions is the question of fighting against impunity, the one of the powerful, uh, the one who can violate uh, laws uh, without the fears of the possible implications of that, those who will create a culture of impunity in the sense more you show that you can violate laws without consequences, more people will follow you because they think you are strong enough to protect them if they violate the law themselves. And I think this is a, a kind of a pervert way also of fragilizing uh, the, the uh, judicial system by showing it uh, weak, incapable of dealing with uh, uh, violations in, in different levels and in different ways. And that culture of impunity uh, continues not only through the official, I mean, structures of a state, you have them within the society, 
you have them in the sexist uh, or, or in the uh, uh, male uh, uh, approach at dominating and uh, subjugating uh, women. Uh, you have them within the racist dynamic in most societies uh, towards the vulnerable uh, groups. Uh, you have them in the relationship with uh, the, the migrants or uh, the refugees. So it is a question as well at bringing uh, justice and social justice and the rejection of all forms of impunity into the political debate as being extremely important. Uh, you might add to that uh, the different levels of work, whether on the local level, on the national level, on the continental level, on, and on the international level. I think we can also respond to the complexities of authoritarianism and the uh, attempts at weakening democracy through another uh, complexity that takes into consideration the geographic question, the local experience, uh, without accepting, of course, what used to be in the past, a kind of a culturalistic approach, meaning, ah, this might, might not work there, this will be only to this people. No, we are within a universal uh, uh, battle against uh, the, the new tendencies uh, that are weakening democracy. Uh, and we do have a series of, uh, of struggles, uh, from the feminist struggle to the anti-racist struggle, uh, to uh, the economic uh, struggle for social justice, to the question of uh, the, the, the impunity and all what uh, is related to it. And that can be done on, on different levels and in different regions uh, and in different contexts, of course. Siad, thank you. Um, I want to bring in um, our Kettering's Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer, John Dedrick. John, thank I've you. One of you give us some, yeah, pull some of these threads. Thank, thank you. It's a privilege to be part of this conversation. I want to focus on the U.S. case and what citizens can do in this election year to defend democracy and do work in a way that continues to build pro-democracy coalitions that cross sectors in the economy and ideological divides. Uh, the work I'm drawing from draws from all of your writings and speeches, as well as work from Protect Democracy, the Democracy Fund, the Othering and Belonging Institute, and many of the other organizations that are working to build large cross-partisan ways of saving our democracy. Here are three big buckets. One, I think we need to claim democracy and make a positive case for democracy, build narratives that have places for people and celebrate democracy. Two, I think we do need to relentlessly engage, 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 engage this year. And three, I think we need to understand acquiescence and respond to it. To, play, to quote Sharon Davies, we need to pledge not to go quietly into the darkness. And what does this actually look like for voters and others in this country in this year? One, building on Marie's point. We, we need to commit to nonviolence, learn its history, how to practice it, and we need to be prepared for violent circumstances. We need to remember that nonviolence offers a powerful democratic counter narrative to authoritarianism. Two, we need to connect democracy to all the issues we're concerned about, and especially those that threaten inclusive democracy. As Maria writes in one of her recent essays, don't silo a strategy on racism away from a strategy on democracy and authoritarianism. See them as two sides of the same coin. Third, we need to actively support election workers and officials. If you can, walk in their shoes for a day. In 2020, it took 775,000 poll workers working at 132,000 polling stations across the country to make the election happen. We can create accountability by having people at the polls and we are needed. Fourth, building on the work of John Powell and many of the comments here, we can build short bridges. Don't, don't reach for the extremes, reach for the short bridges, create spaces that will expand the we and we the people. Build those bridges across ideological divides, across sectors, across faith communities. Next, we need to support moderate and pro-democracy candidates and political leaders, whatever their party. A, a number of you have spoken to this. We need to support, in Steve's terms, the democratic loyalist. If we don't, there's the chance that semi-loyalism, quote, will kill our democracy. Next, we need to support nonpartisan pro-democracy issues, such as redistricting reform and ballot measures that often happen at the state level. They matter, 
And as as Maria and others have noted, at the state level, there are actually often influences and e efforts to divide. Uh, next, uh, we need to understand misinformation, identify it, and we need to work to counter it. Ziad spoke about the way that the rhetoric of the right has been adopted in the mainstream discourse and the threats to that. We need to ask hard questions of all of our sources, and we need in our daily lives to watch out for hyperbole and any time we're talking fast and loose. What's sometimes called BS uh, isn't just casual. It can be a real problem that primes opinions that endure. John Petroselli's work is very good on this. And finally, I'll close with this. Back to the point of the narrative. Own the word democracy. And let's remember that democracy is not a partisan issue. Democracy is not a partisan issue. To paraphrase John Dewey, democracy is a way of life. It's how we live better lives together. It's relational. It takes shared work and time. And it takes all of us. If we are going to live in a world of thriving democracies that protect the rights of all, and fulfill our civic responsibilities. Thank you kindly. John, thank you. I really appreciate these reflections and critical insights um, and owning the word democracy. That's fantastic. I wanna thank all of our panelists. You covered so much in such a short amount of time. Um, it's been a riveting discussion and this is an important topic. So thank you. I also wanna thank my global team members, Lisa Boomberry, Phil Lurie, Ilana Marin and Kelly Palmer, also Kate Schneider, Sarah Murphy, the rest of the Kettering Foundation communications team for making this webinar possible. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you who were watching us for joining us. Um, a recording of this webinar will be available soon and we look forward to continued conversations on this and other topics. So thank you. <laughs>